intelligent design was created, uh, and I'm very swift with this, in 1978. And its specific purpose uh, in, in, in its creation is to bring together the design of the United States. They were scattered uh, across the campus uh, and uh, had homes, different colleges. And part of the purpose was to bring these disciplines uh, together so that there could be a fruitful uh, interaction. What has resulted, as the Dean has uh, often pointed out, is the true transformation of these one separate uh, disciplines into a strong interdisciplinary effort. And if you uh, took advantage of the opportunity to visit upstairs and bring your gallery, you saw some of the results of that effort. At this university, we have seen how quickly some programs have improved their national and regional reputation because of this marriage that uh, resulted when we created the college. We've seen how the quality of teaching and the quality of collaborations have excelled in their focus on the full essence of design education at this university and of practice. Tom, your college, your faculty and staff, your students, your alumni and friends are all to be commended for their vision and advanced recognition of the benefits of such a reorganization for the reef. Tonight, it is really my honor to introduce a, a dear friend, Spiro Kostov. Um, Spiro was uh, early on educated in the humanities in his native Turkey. He came to Yale where he received his PhD and taught for several years in art history. And since 1965, he has taught at the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, I guess I really got to know him most when uh, I was a visiting professor at Berkeley. I got to do that for one semester. And when anybody goes to Berkeley, the first advice you get is go sit on Spiro's class on Rome. Um, he's well known there as, uh, uh, for his teaching, uh, for the intellectual excitement and drama of his teaching. Um, and it was well worth uh, sitting in on a class. I hadn't done that for a long time. In addition to teaching, he's also served as the laundry list, kind of the president of the Society of Architectural Historians, member of the MIT Visiting Committee uh, in the School of uh, Architecture and Planning, a panelist for the General Research Program of the National Endowment for the Humanities, a member of the editorial boards for the Design Book Review for Places, and for, uh, and for the Architectural History Foundation. He most recently is known to all of us as the host and the author of the PBS series on television, five-part series on design, America by Design. Um, since 1965, though, he's written and edited a series of a number of books uh, in his field, and I think that the, I want to read to you the titles of these books, because I think that they, uh, I think that's interesting. 1965, the first book was The Orthodox, Orthodox Baptistry of Ravenna. The second book in 72 was called The Case of God, The Monastic Environment of Byzantine Cappadocia. In 1973, he wrote The Third Rome, Traffic and Glory. Traffic and Glory. In 1977, he wrote a book called The Architect, Chapters in the History of the Profession. I actually added that, excuse me. In 1978, he wrote The Emperor and the Duchy in Art and Architecture in the Service of Politics and in 1985, History of Architecture, Settings, and Rituals. It seems to me that even the titles of these works tell for me um, kind of the story of a development of an historian who perhaps started out uh, somewhat traditional, uh, as a traditionalist, if you will, writing about uh, temples and the special palaces. Um, and he turned in over time to a student of the way that these architectural works and urban works are interwoven in with the fabric of everyday buildings in the city and also its social and political situation. And this inclusive approach, an approach that places um, monuments or artifacts in the culture is what I think makes him so important as a lecturer. Um, just to return for a minute to the last book I mentioned, which uh, many students here probably know as a textbook, um, <laughs> The History of Architecture, um, I'd like to read just for a second from a review in the uh, New York Times book review um, written by William Alonso. Um, for Mr. Kostoff, architecture is a social act, the material theater of human activity. He does write brilliantly on architectural style, but it is only one of, but this is only one of his considerations. His broader theme is the embodiment of any architecture 
of the culture, in any architecture of the culture, excuse me, economy, politics, technology, and ideas of the time and place in which the architecture appeared. This is why I think uh, Spiro is the uh, exactly perfect historian to come and lead off our lecture series. And I'd like to help you, ask you to help me welcome Spiro Kassoff. Thank you, Michael. I have this so I can't shake. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, Greeks are short. You know this by now. Let's see if I can work this around to my purposes. A um, little violence probably helps. Well, it won't work. That's fine. Um, uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm obviously honored. I have to hook this on, too. I'm not very technological. I'm told to do these things. Uh, give me a second. This is embarrassing. There we are. Um, I'm honored to uh, be asked to be part of your celebrations. I teach in a college called the College of Environmental Design, and we take special pride that this phrase, invented, we are told, by our great uh, past leader, William Worcester, uh, was probably first used by us. And uh, again, it was a matter of coming together under some stress uh, to bring a disparate and very independent apartments into one new building and uh, uh, force all of us to recognize that the arts indeed have to work together. Uh, they cannot do their solita solitary incestuous business uh, all by themselves in a corner. Uh, therefore, uh, I think it's fitting probably that I should come to a sister uh, organization that had the same idea and program. Uh, I'm also uh, very flattered to hear what Michael has to say about my work. Usually, these wonderful introductions make your life sound much more important than it really is. In this case, however, I would like to dwell a little bit uh, on uh, those uh, books he mentioned because they're germane uh, to my argument this evening. Um, I, in fact, started as an art historian um, in an art history department, quite separate from the architecture department at Yale, and moved to Berkeley intentionally. I wasn't forced out of Yale, I want that established for the record, <laughs> because uh, of a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, one of these reasons was that I wanted to teach aspiring professionals. It seemed to me that teaching in an art history department, one really taught already committed people, liberal arts students who thought art history was another one of these nice subjects to have, and it went along with the rest of the liberal arts education. I wanted to see how professional students, uh, who are not necessarily beholden uh, to these uh, humanistic disciplines, but who want to see some kind of relevance of all this history to their uh, practice, I wanted to see what that challenge would be like. But secondly, uh, a secondary reason was that I felt rather uncomfortable with the notion that here I was teaching the history of art uh, in a situation where the implication was that art is really something separate from architecture. There might be historians of architecture, too. In other words, we would take a building that, of course, had the architecture and the arts on its walls, on its ceilings, and somehow divorce the two as if we were empowered by somebody to decimate a total work uh, for our own uh, turf interests. Now, when I came to, uh, to uh, Berkeley, I found out I was expected to do the same only from the other corner. I was allowed to talk about buildings, the shells, as much as I wanted to, but I wasn't supposed to touch the art because there was an art history department next door, and they did that. Now, the reason why this seemed bothersome to me is that throughout history, until really fairly recently, as history goes, the arts were inseparable. 
Uh, it was clear to me that if I can have the first slides, uh, which I have to do myself, bear with me. I'm uh, really paleotechnological, and I, I, uh, I do the best I can. Already, I'm too ahead. I'm sorry. I have to start. Let's see if I can go. There. That's the first. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Some kind soul there is doing this for me. Um, the notion was that I couldn't see really how you could study a Byzantine church, for example, and I'm reminding you of it by showing you the church of St. Mark's in Venice on the left, or a Romanesque uh, abbey church, uh, like the one on the right, uh, without uh, merging architectural and art considerations in your discussion. This is not only because the sculpture and the mosaic work in these buildings is in fact literally inseparable from the physical construct. You can't take them out, they're built in. But also because it is precisely this artwork that informed the, the building, that told us in fact what it meant to its users. In the case of the Byzantine church, often you might say that the architectural form was merely the skeleton for a church-approved hierarchy of images. That costly compromise, after a century's bloody civil war, it is not quite credible to us today, but back then, in the 9th and 10th century AD, a hundred-year war was fought to decide whether images will or will not appear in the Byzantine church. And once the images had won, after many thousands died for this cause, there was a very strict order in which they were allowed to appear on various heights and various spaces in the church. In other words, it was impossible to look at a Byzantine church merely as an architectural artifact, a building of matter and technology and spaces, without realizing that it was merely an excuse to create the skeleton for this hierarchy. And similarly, again, it is impossible to look at a Romanesque church, such as the one you see on the right, and not realize that the very act of entering it was ennobled and given significance by the very precise program of sculpture over the entrance, which separated those who would be blessed from those who would be damned. My own work, in fact, and that's the autobiographical bit that I have to bother you with. Sorry, I'm accustomed to pointing and somebody changes. I have to do it. There we are. Started with this uh, unprepossessing little building in Ravenna, uh, which uh, Michael mentioned. A simple brick exterior. You wouldn't pay the time of day, really, as you went by. And then an absolutely incredibly resplendent interior of mosaic which you see inside. The very purpose of this distinction being that you came from the material, everyday world to enter the stage of your baptism, a building whose inside you saw once in your lifetime, and where the very placement of the baptism of Christ in the dome over the interior of the church, over the font, enhanced and made significant the act of baptism for you down below. Uh, my second book, in fact, stretched this idea to a much larger canvas. The churches that Michael mentioned are in Anatolia, in present-day uh, Turkey. They're rock-cut monasteries in an extraordinarily eerie landscape, which we used to call lunar before we found out what the moon really looked like. Um, and there you see, again, the effort of anonymous monks whose very a uh, livelihood whose very life was dependent on hiding in these rocks, nonetheless feeling the obligation of giving them civilized meaning, religious fervor, with this painful reconstruction of a pictorial scheme such as that done in the capital of Constantinople. And then again, when I wrote about Rome, modern Rome, later on, it struck me again how, under Mussolini, in fascist Rome, an elaborate conceit to prove the parallelism between 
the first emperor of ancient Rome, Augustus, and the emperor of modern uh, Rome, Mussolini. An elaborate conceit was done up in terms of urbanism, architecture, and the painting, and the, and the figural arts, in a, a piazza such as this one in Rome, where, with the placement of fascist buildings around the mausoleum of Augustus, with the doing of modern art, fascist art, that will bring out the long, continuous history of the imperial idea in Italy. With all of these devices, clearly a propagandistic program was being installed here in the heart of the ancient city of Rome. In other words, all this thing impressed upon me over the years, and I come to you, therefore, impressed with the long tradition of decorating our buildings, uh, with the absolute imperative of looking at art and architecture together. And I come also curious about why this imperative seems to have declined in the second quarter of our own century, in recent decades, and perhaps a little anxious about its future. Now, since the future is best left to futurists and futurologists and visionaries, my task as a historian is to highlight the past, really, the issue through past instance, and let you derive uh, 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 what uh, 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 message you must. Since a survey of the collaboration of the arts through history would take a semester at least, not to say a year, I will propose here, uh, with your patience, to look briskly at five case studies uh, selected with some purpose from across the centuries uh, to make uh, the point clear to you at the end. These will be the Parthenon in the ancient city of Athens in the fifth century BC, the Palazzo Comunale, the communal palace, the city hall in Siena in the 13th, 14th century AD, St. Peter's in Rome in the 17th century AD, and two U.S. examples, United States examples, the Boston Public Library, the premier monument of what we used to call the American Renaissance, and finally the Rockefeller Center, uh, one of the last programs of public art in this country before the disfavor of academicism and the triumph of modernism had combined effectively to still a means of popular communication between what we build and who we would like to believe we are. To come to my first example, and these will be very brisk, I know they're familiar to you, in the month of the Hecatompeon of every year, our own July, August, in the high, hot summer of Attica, the citizens of ancient Athens put together a great festival for their eponymous goddess, Athena, to celebrate her birthday. Several days this festival went on, games and cultural events, and then at daybreak of the final day, a splendid procession called the Panathenaic procession. Through the marketplace they moved of the city and up the Acropolis, which you see here, carrying a garment to be worn by the goddess, changed every year during this procession, the so-called peplos. The cavalry went first, the horsemen of Athens, the elders with olive branches, young men with the oil jars that were used in the rituals, sacrificial animals, and then maidens carrying this garment, which had been woven during the year by selected uh, women of the city. The entire city then, doing honor to their virgin goddess, both a goddess of the homegrown hearth and the armed warrior maiden who had saved them from so many disasters, including the fairly recent Persian invasions that she had helped uh, her city defend against. Uh, the goddess then, who was known under two guises in the Acropolis as the warrior goddess in the Parthenon, which you see here peeking through the columns on the right, and in a smaller temple, the Erechtheum as the home goddess, dressed 
in that humble cloak, uh, holding a bowl of grain and oil. Uh, this goddess then, uh, being honored on the hilltop with an entirely new program in the fifth century because the Persians had destroyed the old sanctuary, a program that was under the direction of the politician Pericles and under one sculptor, the sculptor Phidias. Now, the point is important here in showing that back then in the fifth century BC, in such an elaborate urban program, one person was designated as artistic director. A person was to be in charge of everything, buildings and art. Each building, of course, under a separate architect, many sculptors and painters working, but one overseeing mind, one overseeing a vision. All this knowledge about the goddess, about her activities, about how she had fought her uncle Poseidon to gain possession of Attica, he with his trident and his horses, she with her olive tree, about how she had helped the city of Athens defeat the Persians, all this knowledge being common to all the citizens of Athens, public art was not supposed to be novel in subject matter or a surprise, but merely an affirmation of commonly held beliefs, a subtle commentary upon these beliefs. So, in fact, as the procession would have climbed, they would have seen totally familiar images. On the west pediment of the Parthenon, the great battle between Athena and her uncle being represented, a myth we were quite familiar with. Down below in the metopes, emblematic figures of uh, centaurs and lapiths, another mythical subject of a wedding uh, where beast men attacked the wedding party, raped the women, and so on. The evil in us, the wicked, the animal in us, and the noble. Tied together here, interlinked adversaries, the contest caught in mid-battle. In it, we would be able, of course, to recognize recent history. This is not formally written for us. We read it in our myths. Here are the Greeks and the Persians, clearly. The Persians, our enemies, the wild people, the animals, us, the noble, caught in mid-battle in this emblematic form. And then, as we move a little closer, perhaps for the first time, a real surprise. Us on the temple. The very procession that is going down below, now shown on a frieze wrapping itself around the building. There again, the horsemen of Athens conquered never, as the sources say. There again, those of us who do other chores in the procession, the oil jar bearers, uh, the leaders of the sacrificial animals, that wonderful gesture of the heifer lifting its head uh, uh, as if in anticipation of what is to come uh, to it. And there, too, in the space between the exterior row of columns and the walls of the temple where the frieze is, the same columnar shapes reflected in the maidens who paired care, uh, carry the peplos, uh, the new garment that we are going to replace the old one uh, on our goddess in her little temple, showing her as the goddess of the hearth. Now, all this, I think, stresses a few things that makes our first case important. First, that art in ancient Athens was a public matter. It was a public necessity for the Greek of the classical period. And secondly, that a strong identity, a cohesive sense of community in Athens made it possible to use public art as a form of self-expression, a medium that worked with the land, the buildings, and our memory to endow us with our recognition of ourselves and give us that comfort of fellowship. Now, the two things, public art and a sense of community, must work together, must come together, I think. 
are necessary together for this kind of moving testimonial of a time and a place. We have examples in history where tight communities like Athens uh, did not feel this Greek urgency for public expression through the visual arts. The covenanted towns of colonial New England, I think, make the point. It was, in fact, considered not at all proper to have a display of public art. Whatever art one had was in the privacy of one's own house. And there are cases, we have, in fact, uh, many examples, many modern examples, where there is a lot of public art all around, but there being no tight-knit, purposeful association of people to make this public art edifying, to make a clear-headed use of it, it seems merely ornamental and not consequential. I want to argue later on that this is the case with the modern city by and large places like New York and Los Angeles, perhaps even much smaller cities than these. There is so little common purpose, so little sense that the people come with the place, that it is hard to find themes of a binding self-recognition, like those that were orchestrated by the sculptor Phidias and his vast crew of artists and craftsmen for the limestone citadel of the great goddess whose name Athena bore proudly. Uh, sorry, Athens bore proudly. This leads me to my second case study, moving another, oh, 13, 14 centuries, uh, what are 15 centuries for history, this match between the public urge for artistic reinforcement of a community's traditional values and future hopes and a society of a size and structure to make this public vision are possible. We are still in Athens, let's move on here. And this a second study, uh, my slide probably fell through, I'm sure it will be rescued in a minute, uh, deals with the city-states of Tuscany in the later Middle Ages. In fact, that period thought of itself as being a revival of the ancient classical notion of the polis, or city-state. Remember Charles Martel's question to Dante, would it not be worse for man on earth if he were not a citizen? Or Fra Giordano da Rivalto pre preaching in Santa Maria Novella in Florence, the word city, he said, kiwitas, sounds almost like love, caritas, and through love are cities built since men delight in living together. This notion then of the ancient city-state, where the people are what make the city, where the community is the city. This is being returned to, in the later Middle Ages, in northern Italy. And it is here that we find again lay writers using the word city as implying an attempt to reach a just human society. And the role of the citizen as being that of one who shoulders public responsibilities to ensure self-government, justice, and concord. At the same time, the city itself is considered a work of art, the frame that houses not only good government, but also beauty. Order, in fact, in the physical world is equivalent with good government, with a good society with a just society. So we see, like Phidias in ancient Greece, again, individual masters at large, guiding for the city government, the city form, the public buildings, and their art. People like Arnolfo di Cambio and Giotto at Florence, which you see now on the screen, and people like Lorenzo Maitani at Orvieto, who was appointed, we hear, in 1310 as the city's universalis caput magister, the universal headmaster, or rather head craftsman of the city. Now, this return to the concept of the city shaped to represent our own communal hopes and beliefs, and of the art from the smallest scale 
public art to the largest as being a reinforcement of these same beliefs. We see, I think, most clearly in one of these cities in Tuscany, namely Siena, which is my second case. I'm sure Siena is familiar to you. The very form itself, representative of a long struggle for the city to reach its own independence. There on one hilltop, you see the prior lord, the bishop of Siena, with his cathedral and palace. And there down below, in the hillside, in the uh, hollow of the campo of our own space, of our own forum, the beacon of our own self-governance, the tall tower of the city hall, pitting itself against the prior tradition of the feudal lordship of the bishop. And everywhere there in the late Middle Ages, when we have asserted our independence, the notion of combining art, architecture, and urbanism to make this message patent can be read. Here, for example, in this wonderful harboring uh, uh, hollow of the, of the campo, our own city hall, proudly proclaiming our independence, and inside it, a celebration of our own acts, doings, and beliefs. This time, a little more literally expressed than in Athens. In Athens, we would understand them through our myths. Here, rather, we see the paintings inside the city hall as being a little more specific. They are religious paintings, which I'm not showing you. This is taken for granted, obviously. But there are also celebrations of actual events, a public record of the city's military victories, its great generals, uh, 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 shown through the medium of great artists uh, in the city. For example, here on the left is uh, Guido Riccio da Fogliano, between two very specific places that we would recognize of Sienese territory, Montemassi and Sassoforte, which he had freed from siege. And we learn, in fact, that the commune had paid the painter Simone Martini to undertake a journey to visit these fortresses so that he could paint them accurately. Then, side by side with these very specific recent historical events, allegories of government, of good government and bad government, its aims and means. Here we uh, see the great name of Ambrogio Lorenzetti uh, making enormous uh, paintings for the four walls of the main room, the main meeting hall in uh, the city hall. The uh, picture you have on the right, a little detail of an allegory of justice and the common good replete with subtitles, so we'll get the message, the ruler, common good, flanked by the cardinal virtues of fortitude and prudence on one side, temperance and justice on the other, and then reclining besides fortitude, peace, whom you see here. Between the ruler and temperance is the Aristotelian virtue of magnanimity. Above the ruler's head, the theological virtues of faith, love, and charity. On the other walls, the good government fresco, showing the city bustling, the countryside peaceful uh, and fruitful under the figure of security who holds a scroll and begins uh, saying uh, the following inscription, without fear, let each man freely walk, and working let everyone uh, sow, and so on. Then a much damaged tyranny fresco showing the opposite of what happens when you don't have good government, war, treason, fury, discord, and fraud, all of them labeled for us. Uh, here a merchant robbed, there an infant strangled, to see why it is that we are in a good city with a good government. Now, clearly you will recognize the differences with Athens. We're at a slightly different point of my argument here. Here we have a very complicated program. It isn't easily understood by everyone as the Athenian program on the Parthenon was. Somebody or some persons of high education familiar with such arcane matters as Thomistic Aristotelianism and things of this kind, uh, as modified by early 14th century Italian jurists 
was responsible for writing out this elaborate allegorical uh, program. Uh, 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 therefore, uh, uh, like minds of that educational level, would have un understood and appreciated the complexities of the artistic program. But the common people were not left out. That is my point. Something out of the paintings, too, could be gotten by them, even if they couldn't fathom uh, the entire uh, 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 a range of complicated me meanings that were embedded in the program. First of all, uh, the common people were recognized that this was indeed their city and their program. There is Santa Anna wearing her dress. There is my house. This is the third one on the left. In other words, the background, the people uh, actually inhabiting the spaces of these allegories are again us, uh, the people who are in the streets uh, of uh, uh, Siena, whose houses, in fact, provide the detail for the painting itself. And finally, I think, even if this were not enough to bind us to this program, the recognition that it is our own artists who made this, the pride in our own folk, in our own sons. Uh, uh, this will, in fact, be the tradition that continues to this day in Siena, where every Sienese uh, child uh, will be uh, very proud that its ancestry resides, in fact, in these frescoes, in these paintings, in 13th century uh, Siena, many centuries before uh, the present generations were born. It is precisely this sense of continuity, of our own talent invested in our own city, that produces that bond that brings people uh, from all corners to admire this very local event. Isn't it odd? that with such a very specific program, both in Athens and in Siena, somehow, instead of having provincial, local, and insignificant events, they rise precisely because of their specificity into a realm of universal meaning. So today we flock to these places to see them again. Now this point is important because we often think that propaganda art, and certainly much of Sienese art was propaganda, as was Athenian art, is slanted and biased. It is a one-sided glorification of the people who were involved at the time. We say of allegorical art that it is not accessible to the public, and hence it is, in fact, elitist. We forget that if public art is good or convincing, if it survives as a worthwhile masterpiece of some strongly shaped vision, it will long outlive the precise messages of its propaganda or its abstruse iconography. If it is bad art or flaccid or inflationary, it will remain bad, flaccid or inflationary, whether we understand the message clearly or not. We, theref we therefore have to admit in the end, I think, that good just societies don't automatically produce good art, whatever the earnestness of their patronage. And conversely, public art with perfectly objectionable messages, Assyrians destroying a city, for example, or perfectly objectionable rulers, uh, the public portrait head of Nero, for example, may be quite good art, and therefore, in a funny way, timeless. So this is ultimately what must be stressed. The joy public art engenders, the enduring affection it is capable of fostering, the public pride that it might encapsulate, the service it might perform as the repository of memories of past events or the setting of present ones. This is what is important, rather than any very specific historic and perhaps propagandistic message in its initial uh, original form. The talking sta statues of Rome, for example, are one such fond uh, uh, element of Roman society. And even the Victor Emmanuel monument, for those of you who have seen it, surely one of the most brutal, ugly monuments uh, in the history of art, has a special bond to the people of Rome because of being embedded in their own history, in their own memories, because it being a pleasant thing to walk around in, admire the stones, touch them, and so on. Rome, in fact, I think to me, 
is probably the quintessential city for a discussion of public art. Remember the Baroque period in Rome, which is slowly my way of slipping into my third example. Remember the challenge of the Counter-Reformation. One of the biggest challenges against the established Catholic Church, uh, the challenge of Protestantism, and the exuberant celebration of the Church triumphant, having put behind uh, itself, or so it thought, this revolution. The celebration of Roman supremacy, the authority of the Vicar of Christ, which is expressed in so much of Baroque art. The Baroque mastery over sight and prior incident. The sense of theater inside and outside buildings, buildings buckling and curving, uh, um, uh, all the arts being used in the inside, materials manipulated to create sensations and experiences. Entire public spaces uh, uh, collecting uh, their garbage through the centuries, little bits of buildings and uh, moldings and this uh, and, and that being given a new unity by one single gesture, an obelisk in the middle, a great fountain uh, flowing anew. How many of us really remember, understand, or care that each one of these seemingly improvised programs had what the Baroque period called a concetto, a very specific program of meaning uh, that had to do with a specific reigning pope, who commissioned the work of art with his seals, with Christian dogma, perhaps with the universal imagery of the church. We may not remember or know these things, but then and now, common people still could derive a lot of pleasure with this splash of water and marble, with this manipulation and orchestration of public spaces, with this combination of all the arts to create what the Germans called a Gesamtkunstwerk, a total work of art. Uh, that embraces and harbors us. Uh, for example, my third case study is, of course, the drama of St. Peter's. I don't think you have to be a Catholic. It may even help, if you're not, to appreciate the tremendous orchestration of an entire segment of city, urbanism, architecture, sculpture, painting, to get us through a sequence, a culmination, and a climax. To see, for example, us in this piazza, which started with something of a jumble, as you can see here, what Bernini had to work with, and I think I have a pointer that I must use at least once, uh, was this sort of thing in the 1630s and, and 40s. A splendidly finished church, which took a uh, 100 years or so to do, uh, a prior pope bringing an obelisk and putting it in the middle of this nowhere place. Uh, the Vatican Palace, not particularly tidy, a series of cliff-like blocks. A law a row of uh, office buildings uh, for the uh, Vatican offices. And really, that is it. And one fountain that was here that was uh, hoping to get another fountain on the other side. And here is, of course, Bernini's culmination of this program, the combination of the church, the path through which we come to it across the river, the Vatican Palace and these buildings, with this enormously powerful gesture of what he called the arms of the church, embracing Catholics, agnostics, and heretics alike and he is imagining that there will be a third arm here which would briefly detain you before you came into this splendid uh, space, uh, and the demolition of these buildings to create an axial spine. In fact, a program that was not uh, a, a, a accomplished until this century. Neither was the third arm accomplished. But enough was there so that when you came, as you were intended to do, from the thickness of the core of the historic city to the one bridge that then led across to the Borgo, the Vatican area, the drama began already. You are confronted by two saints, Peter and Paul, the great twins of Christian Rome, uh, Peter with his book, Paul with his sword, uh, greeting you as you enter. You will see them again at the end of our sequence at the entrance to St. Peter's to remind you that the sequence is beginning to close. Then the bridge itself is not left untouched. 
It is flanked by angels who carry the symbols of Christ's passion. Uh, the nails, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, um, instrument for, for the flogging, the crown of thorns, and so on, greeting us in a processional way across to the hulking mass of the Casta Sant'Angelo, the great medieval castle, formerly uh, the tomb of the Emperor Hadrian, uh, that makes the crossing into the Vatican territory. We there turn left and proceed now, since Bernini's great access was not done, through a series of rather narrow streets, coming either this way or that way, to what presumably would have stopped us if the third arm were first built, temporarily holding us there in anticipation, constricting us, and then releasing us into this splendid, ample space, seeming infinitely more ample because of our constriction as we came along, where the floor begins to dip toward the center, where the great axis we followed is slowed down by the counteraxis of the obelisk and the, now the two matching uh, fountains, and where the meaning of this program is only complete when you see it, of course, filled with people, the thousands and thousands who came uh, to get the blessing Urbi et Orbi by the Pope, either on regular Sunday services or in the great feast days of the year. The entire rather overwhelming uh, complex, then, is meaningful only when the community when we are incited, when people are incited. And there, this cross axis with the little temple fronts uh, 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 stressing the middle of these arms, the obelisk and the two fountains, would slow us down enough so that we proceed now toward our goal, a little piazza climbing uphill toward the facade of the building, the whole embraced uh, by more than 150 statues. We really don't know quite who they are. They're obviously saints. They're people who deserve to be up there. The whole point is that it is a, a concentrated ribbon, something that ties together these incredibly expansive uh, architectural gestures and bring us into this inner court which will be our crowding to get into uh, St. Peter's. And there we're confronted by stairs that simply cascade down toward us. Uh, there we are trying to get into the church, and there they are uh, meeting us uh, like ripples of water, of marble water, and we work against them. We see again Peter and Paul greeting us now at the entrance of the facade, again with the sword and the keys uh, to paradise. And then we squeeze through uh, the gate, uh, or a series of them, into a corridor, the art never ceases, on the left of which, as we enter, is the equestrian statue of Constantine, the first Christian emperor, and on the right, in the stair that leads, in fact, to the Vatican Palace, uh, the statue, uh, equestrian statue of Charlemagne, the first crowned emperor of the West. Both of them extremely important for the power of the Bishop of Rome in history. And then through the uh, doors of the vestibule that we are in to the vastness of the basilica, where now our attention is pulled directly by light as well as by a fixture that, that stresses the axis at the end of the basilica, this strange light-hearted baldachin, which in fact is tall, as tall as a four-story building, as a Palazzo Farnese, and has incredible foundations because it's very heavy uh, uh, to carry. In fact, it is made to seem, uh, by the miracles of art, to be a little uh, stand over the great altar of St. Peter's, under, whom of under which, of course, uh, St. Peter himself uh, is buried. We proceed to this area, helped by the arts, and there, finally, we are at the goal of our pilgrimage, with the great baldachin of Bernini in the middle. Uh, our eye is led upward by these uh, twisting columns so that we can read the great inscription and the meaning of it all. Uh, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Peter up above, Peter below us, and still the climax doesn't stop. We have to look behind it where Peter's throne, the throne of the bishops of Rome, the Cathedra Petri, is lifted by four saints, two from the east, two from the west, 
telling you the universality of the church, and of course, in a resplendent uh, effect of light at the top, in alabaster, the Holy Spirit, the dove of the Holy Spirit. Now, I submit that you really don't have to be uh, a Catholic or a devoted follower of the uh, Jesuitical arguments of the 16th and 17th century to enjoy this incredible demonstration of the union of the arts, of urbanism and architecture and all the figural arts in a zestful orchestration of a total city. Uh, now, these kinds of orchestrations, of course, you are aware, are easy for autocracy, papal Rome, where one boss uh, gives the order and has the money. Versailles, the Paris of the Baron Osman and Napoleon III in the 19th century. Or at least they're possible where there is a centralized vision, where the community believes in something, and everybody can join in this belief, even if the belief is something as universal and simple as the love of Christ, or even if it is uh, the glorification of kingship, or something. In other words, a confident national purpose, a desire to create the semblance of unity, a competitive grandeur in relation to older, brilliant cultures that you wish to emulate or equal or surpass. Now, in America, I think we have had one such extraordinary moment. And this is the moment that we often call the American Renaissance, which lasted from roughly 1876 or so to World War I. There was a unified vision. It may be a little embarrassing today to talk about manifest destiny, to talk about a unified country after the horrors of the Civil War, but it, it is what held us together. The national mood was one that wanted unity, in fact, uniformity. There was a kind of lofty idealism that began to show itself in our public buildings, in an embracement of public art that we had never shown before in the colonial period and the earlier decades of the 19th century. There was an attempt to compete and surpass Europe in our monumentality. And the marvel is that we created a movement that is legitimately called, I think, the Renaissance, where all the arts flourished as perhaps never before, stained glass and sculpture and painting. We created all this by persuasion. We are not a country of princes. We don't have a pope or a Louis XIV to tell, the, to tell us to will the creation of an entire city form and its art. We are much like, I think, Athens or Siena had been. We have to persuade ourselves of a common uh, purpose, a common goal, and it is precisely this marvel of the American re Renaissance, this sweeping revival of the arts in this country, which was accomplished by a rather elite core of New York-based artists, architects, and craftsmen. Some rich folk, uh, they persuaded to become civic-minded, but also, I think, a general desire for the betterment of our environment. With civic improvement societies, associations, city art commissions, all working together, regional museums, expositions, societies of artists, such as the Society of American Artists founded in 1877, or the Art Students League of New York in 75, or the Architectural League of New York in 1881, art magazines like American Architect and Building News, the Art Review, etc. All of these expressing this desire for us to put ourselves on the map of Western civilization with our art. Imagine this spectacle of Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, which you see here. This terrific orchestration, again, of urbanism, of public art, all coming from a desire for a unified vision and all created miraculously, not through autocratic government, but through de the devices of democracy that linked us to Athens and the communes of late medieval Tuscany. But the question 
for us remained a little bit ambiguous. What should we represent in this new civic urbanism? Uh, what would the subjects be that would express for us who we are the way those good government uh, frescoes did for, for Siena or the great program of Athena did for the Parthenon? Well, it wasn't really very easy for us to come to those kinds of programs. Uh, the great precedent for this Renaissance is, in fact, Boston Public Library, my fourth example, uh, in Boston in the 1880s, which intentionally began uh, as a collaborative work of artists. Right from the entrance door, the twin statues flanking the ma main door by Bella Pratt, showing science and art, and then all through the building, statues and memorials of heroes and patriots, murals, etc. We brought in foreign people like Puvi de Chavan uh, to do paintings. We brought in our own best talents. But when you look at the subjects, when you read their titles, they are uh, subjects like Puvi de Chavan's The Muses of Inspiration Hail the Spirit, the Harbinger of Light. Not a very easy subject to warm up to, you know, if you are using the library. Or Edwin Austin Abbey's The Quest of the Holy Grail. Or John Singer Sargent's The History of Religion. Well, something has now changed a little bit in our modern period from Athens, from Siena, from Rome. We have the vision, we have the will, we have galvanized the arts, we have made patrons of robber barons. We have trained artists in European academies to do it. But we don't know really what to say. In come people seeing themes representing Homer, or the history of painting, or the evolution of civilization in the Boston Library, in the Library of Congress in Washington, which you see uh, now here, much of this is that great national obsession we had and still have to show that we belong in the roll call of high cultures, that we are young but worthy heirs of the millennial cultural bounty of the old world. So ours was an edifying effort of the upper classes to make us nobler as a nation, proud of our place in the scheme of things, worthy citizens of a world state, but perhaps in the process depriving us of that identity with public art that was there in Baroque Rome, in late medieval Siena, in Periclean Athens. Here is the muralist Edwin Blashfield in 1913. The names of public buildings are the century marks of the ages. Wherever the footprints of the spirit of civilization have rested most firmly, some milestone of human progress has risen to be called the Parthenon, or Notre Dame, or Jotter's Tower, or the Louvre, and to teach from within and without, by proportion and scale, by picture and statue, the history of the people who built it, to celebrate patriotism, inculcate morals, and to stand as the visible concrete symbol of high endeavor. All very true, but a little puzzling for us, the distancing of the people from the meanings and joys of the arts, I think is a problem we had begun to encounter immediately on embracing high culture and high art. That is the way they spoke in those days, just as in this quote, like graduation day addresses. But the movement was long, committed, and serious, the products extraordinarily fine, and at least superbly competent, if nothing else. So why did they get to seem amusing in the end? and even a little embarrassing today. Why is the world not rushing to see the frescoes of the Boston Public Library the way they rush to Versailles and Assisi? I think this is an enormous topic, obviously. Is it because these, our paintings and sculptures and urban programs of the American Renaissance are too universal to be particular, as opposed to Siena and Athens and Rome, which were particular enough to give 
universal meaning? Is it because they are too pompous and righteous to be really fun? The way Rome is, without our understanding the abstruse iconography uh, that the Pope's iconographers had, uh, had planned for us, are they really too far removed from a common person's daily concerns? What of the war, World War I, and the toppling of the old order? Does this have anything to do with the fact that these things now seem terribly distant, not very engaging, perhaps admirable, but not really gut-love objects? At any rate, between the war and the rise of a new phase of public art in America, that of the agencies of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the idealism of the American Renaissance was gone, and with it, that surprisingly harmonious vision shared by all branches of art was also gone. By the time we reach my final case, Rockefeller Center, we have something that properly defines our dilemma we have now monuments of a corporate urbanism, not a civic one, of a private public realm represented by banks and skyscrapers and so forth, not by public libraries and city halls and county courthouses. Notable this new public art for its attempt to, again to have a collaboration for the chance it provided to painters and sculptors to experiment with materials and new processes, with aluminum and photomurals, etc. But the confusion now about themes, about the subject of our vision, is almost entirely complete. Whom to invite? What to tell them to represent? What the purpose of it all was? At least, Mr. Rockefeller was honest about it. When an attempt was made to secure something from modern artists for the Rockefeller Center, and some of them didn't respond, I don't blame them. Imagine asking Picasso or Matisse to illustrate a theme such as man's ultimate destiny depends on his acceptance of the lessons taught him close on 2,000 years ago. Can you imagine Picasso responding uh, to this? Well, anyway, when they did not even have the courtesy to respond to, Mr. <laughs> to Rockefeller, he wrote, for advertising purposes, I felt that Matisse and Picasso had the greatest drawing value. And irrespective of my feeling about their work, which wasn't much, I felt it was highly important to secure them. In other words, the chief client has really no great conviction about the value of artistic independence or the integrity of artistic genius. He has no great convic conviction about the values he wants to celebrate. In fact, he hires a philosopher from the University of Southern California, Hartley Burr Alexander, to work out a theme for this whole complex. What should we represent? He has no idea. He wants to pay somebody to tell him. And this man from the University of Southern California comes up with a subject, Omo Fabor, Man the Builder. And then, when Rockefeller isn't too keen on this, Frontiers of Time, how about that? Well, JDR's own academics suggest themes that he likes better. These are things like the contemporary world, or America in the pageant of civilization. The final theme is finally settled to be new frontiers and the march of civilization. So a private client in a corporate vision of America with a made-up subject that has to have a committee to be decided upon because it isn't obvious, it isn't gripping, it's not going to involve us all, creates this rather marvelous congregation of all the arts in downtown Manhattan, where now we really, most of us, have nothing to fall back on except the fun things there. We don't respond to the quest for the fountain of eternal youth, 
or intelligence awakening mankind. But what we do understand is Lee Laurie's atlas, Paul Manship's, what was called at the time, tawdry Prometheus in the lower plaza when we watched skaters. When there was an attempt to make some significant art in Rockefeller Center to tell us perhaps what our time was really all about, or perhaps an aspect of it, to try to bond us with some social message, Diego Rivera's great murals, Man at the Crossroads, of course, Mr. Rockefeller had destroyed. It was much too specific, much too realistic, much too close perhaps to the truth. Lenin stared you, for God's sake, from the walls of Rockefeller Center. So this was not appropriate. We took advantage of retreating behind intelligence awakening mankind and other such universal but vapid themes with which no single community can be expected uh, to uh, link up. So we enjoy Lee Laurie's Atlas, we enjoy the tawdry Prometheus, perhaps they are the, because they are the most exposed, perhaps, in the best, most public locations, but I think probably more likely because they're camp, they're really bad enough to be good, and because we really have a yearning to have public spaces peopled, given some totems in human form, totems that can do things we can't, like lift a globe or fly. <laughs> anyway, it's all really very unsatisfactory. Despite this concerted effort to produce a Gesamtkunstwerk, it fizzles. It is not Siena, it is not the Parthenon, it is not St. Peter's, it is not even at this stage in the 30s of this century, even the Library of Congress or the Boston Public Library. What happened? Why did we lose the urgency and flair for public art? That's what I'm sure you would want to answer for yourself. But in the short run, several obvious reasons may be stated. I think the first one we have to mention is that with the 30s and the defeat of the fascist and Nazi empires, the public art that they so espoused for their propaganda, the bloated rhetoric and bombastic heroism of these environments, became emotionally intolerable after World War II, after the horrors of that war. It became clear that especially after 45, we would not allow ourselves to show recognizable human figures in the public sphere, to do murals whose subjects one can read or perhaps intuit, to have great symbolic programs because they came to be associated with totalitarian regimes. That is one aspect, one reason of post-World War II divorce of recognizable public art, figural art, from the public realm. The second reason I think we may cite is that, of course, modernism, the modern style, became triumphant after World War II whose aesthetic both hated literary programs of murals and reliefs and made it physically impossible for them to exist because of these glass envelopes and the curtain wall. At the same time, the triumph of this general acceptance of the, what is called the international style among a corporate clientele whose public relation needs were now served by being modernist this triumph obviously negated even the kind of lofty, idealistic, and incomprehensible public art of Rockefeller Center. Instead, we chose now, corporations especially, to go for an abstract art instead of an art of content. There was a reticence now to say anything explicit, so a nice abstract bronze form or a tube or something that could be nothing 
was preferred. Now, I want to quickly stress that I'm not suggesting for a minute that abstract art is meaningless and that public art has meaning only if you recognize the figures. We have, of course, a great example in recent American history where a terrifically abstract and yet very meaningful public monument found its way in our most sacred stage of nationalism, the Mall in Washington, D.C. What I am saying, however, is that much of the abstract art that began to be used in these modernist environments was a kind of, how shall I say, perhaps cop-out, a kind of attempt not to say or offend, uh, to say anything that might offend anybody, a kind of uh, abstracted, neutralized, anemic, public thing that, of course, got to be placed in equally abstracted, neutralized spaces that not many people used. I think additionally, we have to stress that after World War II, the phenomenal spread of visual images of another kind eroded the need for committed public art. I am, of course, speaking of television on the one hand, which pictures our trials and triumphs in such abundant visual detail that it becomes difficult to build a case for celebrating them publicly with monumental art. But also, I'm stressing monumental public images like Johnny Walker walking on top of a building on Times Square or the giant billboards on the roads trivializing the potency of truly public messages, messages of community and urbaneness and tradition and social continuity. So that a giant revolving bucket of chicken <laughs> replaces, <laughs> replaces the Prometheus statue, or Atlas rather, carrying the globe on Rockefeller Center, which may have been incomprehensible, but at least it implied it was a little more serious than a thigh. <laughs> but all this really may be begging the question. All this may be begging the question. The, the, these are enormously complex reasons why we have not been able to sustain in modern times the sharp cohesiveness of a classical Athens or Siena under the Nine or the broad sweeping continuities of Baroque Rome. And these reasons go back at least as far as the Industrial Revolution. If I had another hour, which I know you don't want me to have, uh, I could uh, get into this a little bit. But to put it very bluntly, modern life has slowly lost, not in this country only, but also abroad, the urgency for public art because I think it has lost the sense of public ritual during much of the 19th century and into the 20th century. Remember that the closest we come today to the Panathenaic procession is St. Patrick's Day parades. The best we can do along the lines of the brilliant flair of Baroque Rome is international expositions with revolving restaurants. We have lost the urgency of public art because we have ceased to be caring about the quality of public life. Long before the present, we have made a clear separation in America between our residential fabric, which is the suburbs, and the central business district, which is devoid of life after 5 p.m. Public art went with the public sector. The public sector denuded of people, except those who work during the day and then go here at night. There is no purpose for having these statues and paintings hanging around. For whom? For what? What are they supposed to represent? Furthermore, in America, we had a further problem, which is another long topic. And that is that with the invention of the skyscraper, in the 80s of the past century, almost 100 years ago, we created a privatized public realm, as I suggested, of banks and corporate buildings, all of them to individual interests, 
which began to overshadow the true public realm of the 18th and early 19th century, the churches, the state houses, and so on, which were the largest buildings around, and around which everything else had its own hierarchical scale. If you look at Trinity Church, as Henry James saw, after a 20-year absence when he returned to New York in 1904, what had happened to his church in the context of New York, you will recognize that the skyscraper city in fact confused altogether the sense of public realm. When a department store is fully the equal in scale and ornament to our churches and government buildings, something is lost in the expression of a public realm, which was there in the City Hall of Siena in the great limestone citadel of Athena in the Acropolis in Athens. So that at the same time that the modern movement made it very hard for representative public art to merge with those glass walls and those abandoned piazzas, so too we were busily through the urban renewal uh, policies of the 50s and 60s, destroying, in fact, much of the finer fabric of the downtown. And so this new privatized realm stood, as it does in Houston, as it does in some places uh, uh, in San Francisco, in fact, all our major downtowns, stood now in a kind of desolate aloneness, even when they're together, not admitting much interaction between the pedestrian and the buildings themselves. And therefore, the public realm being so destroyed, really gutted from within, public art clearly can't find much place. And now at last, it seems to me, we're fighting back. We started about 10, 15 years ago at Portland, uh, in San Francisco, in various other cities, the recent battles of preservation, of contextualism, have made us conscious once more that we must do something about the public realm. Ethnic groups and neighborhoods led the way. If there is no common public vision for a major city, a neighborhood may have a vision. An ethnic group with its own roots may have a vision. So the populist murals and arts and graffiti of the 60s and 70s led the way, I think, to a reappreciation that we must have figures to look at. We must have things to identify with. We must merge these naked plazas and these tall skyscrapers with something that we can be bonded to, respond to. Big guy, look here, a ball in his head. What do you think it is? Something something to engage us. And I think it is out of this, out of the new historicism that insists on build, bringing again the orders and the cornices and those heavily laden, value laden past forms, with them again an attempt, not necessarily all admirable, to create those tight early piazzas, to people them with things as we see them here in Philip Johnson's PPG Plaza in Pittsburgh. I don't particularly admire it, but I admire the intention behind it. Or as we see it in the rather grotesque Portlandia figure that was hoisted atop Michael Graves' building in Portland, Oregon, and probably started us back again in the tradition which we had lost so long, for at least a hundred years, I would say, in this country. To recall the past in the design of our buildings, which postmodernism at its best, and there isn't much of that, brings about. <laughs> to recall at least the intention that the past be in the design of our present buildings is, to my mind, to respect tradition, and tradition, to my mind, is nothing less than the way in which society communicates with itself. To recall our humanity in public art, our public joys or our agony, our dignity or mourning, that is what is important. And to do this is to pay homage 
to that precious sense of association, of community, which makes of every one of us a larger person than we are in our personal life and fills us with the pride of belonging. Thank you. have had enough, by all means, tiptoe out. Not too loudly, so I won't get hurt. <laughs> but I'm happy uh, uh, to, uh, to respond to anything that comes uh, to your minds. I know it's sweeping. Yes? Well, you mentioned in about half the census some of the work done under Franklin Roosevelt. Yes. It seems to be more like Athens and less like Washington, D.C. Uh, and the Center. I should, you right. I should have given a lot more attention to it, but since I'm not doing a survey but case studies, it fell through. Yeah, but it makes America yeah. look a little better than the stuff you showed. Uh, <laughs> that is true. Uh, of course, the argument contra is that it was an artificial insemination of the arts and that, in fact, it was a public works project in the best sense. Now, out of it came a lot of terrible art and some very fine art. But it was a kind of artificially engendered uh, thing, which you might, I suppose, say was true also of the American Renaissance. That was more elitist. That went to the big time money people and said, look, uh, you too can be like the Medici in Florence. Give a public library. Give a fresco. And convince people to do that. Uh, the uh, FDR episode, of course, was more populist more an expression. And I must say, it is remarkable what it has done to our landscape in the small scale. I much more admire the little park benches, the little corners in the, in the cities, all of which have their stamp of FTR, than uh, the uh, a rather, uh, uh, a rather bloated, uh, uh, maybe bigger schemes that uh, uh, we see today, though, m those muscle-bound nudes and uh, various things, various people doing various things and so on. Uh, but it is true, that probably would be a chapter that has to be written. Uh, uh, you're right. Yes? Do you think that air conditioning and automobiles uh, compartmentalizing people and keeping them inside has affected public art? Definitely. I think it comes with this notion of the destruction of the public realm, which I was describing. Uh, we have, in fact, I think th there's a broader issue there. We have privatized the public realm ourselves, not just the corporations. The moment you move to the suburbs, as we did, and I'm not condemning that. It has happened. History has no business condemning things, just explaining them. Uh, but the moment you moved to a suburb, uh, most families interiorized previously public activities. The shopping was nearer to hand. Uh, uh, children were encouraged to uh, get along with the family activities instead of being out in the streets and doing things. Or even our uh, most important uh, reformists, like Olmsted in the park system, was not at all innocent of trying to make us not be ourselves. Olmsted's clear stated purpose was that the parks would kill Little Italy and Chinatown. All those public places where we expressed our individuality in the streets and will make us all a rather unified American uh, citizenry. All of us in the park would act similarly. It was a great civilizing activity. The American Renaissance movement was exactly the same. It is embarrassing to read what they thought about quote unquote slums. You flushed them out with an avenue. So uh, Monument Avenue the opposite side of it is, in fact, the destruction of small neighborhoods in the downtown that meant a continuation of people over 24 hours uh, of the clock, and therefore a public for which public art meant something. All of these are true. And now, of course, the fact that we are more comfortable in the house and in the car than in the piazza downtown. In fact, for a long time, Anglo-Saxon Anglo-American communities considered anyone sitting at a piazza as being somebody who loiters. Uh, this is nothing that occurs to an Italian. You spend an entire day in the piazza. That's what being civilized, that's what being a citizen is. You watch the show. The city is the show. But you know what happened to our great city beautiful piazzas. They're now all uh, full of bombs on benches because it is embarrassing for us 
uh, to linger in public places. For a long time, there was an onus associated with it. We are purposeful people. If you have a huge piazza, the best use you can make of it to cross diagonally and quickly go to your office in, in, instead of moving around or sitting. Now that's coming back. I don't know if, you, if you've been recently to Portland, but the, this wonderful little um, square they have, what is it called, the uh, something, Independence Square or something, everybody pays $25 to buy a brick to put on the floor of the piazza with his name on it. So you see a bunch of people going around all the time like zombies <laughs> looking for their name. It's terribly sweet. You know, that notion again that the city is us and we contribute in the downtown because it's for us. It's our forehole. It's our, it's our room, our public room where we do public things and we're proud of it. Uh, so yes, the answer to your very short, very proper question, my long-winded way is yes, cars and air conditioning and skywalks, uh, peop taking people away from the streets and up at that level, all of these things kill public art, definitely. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's the problem, of course. You hit it right on the head. For example, you may argue that, in fact, Times Square in New York is our equivalent to the great public arenas of the past, that it is our campo of Siena, our Acropolis, because that is where our values are most potently expressed, whether we like, uh, some of us, uh, the, the quality or the, but perhaps Johnny Walker and all the tall buildings and the crowds down below is what we have uh, to give. The other side of it is that artists today, I think again quite justifiably, I'm not an artist but I see their point, refuse to become agents of a public vision. Uh, I shared th a day in Portland some years ago with the sculptor uh, Acock, Alice Acock. Alice is the first name, isn't it? A wonderful uh, uh, articulate artist. I was the historian, she the artist. I made remarks similar to the ones I made this evening. She in response said, you know, even if there were a public vision, what it is to be American today, I'm not sure I want to be the vehicle to express this public vision. I want to do my art and she does, you know, these tremendous architectural pieces, environmental pieces. And let America be proud, if they will, of the fact that I have this gift to make these pieces. And not say, what is she trying to represent? American civilization, television age, uh, the nuclear war, or whatever. She has a point, of course, and I see that too. In other words, we are not in an age where artists are satisfied with being the gifted vehicles of a public vision. Do you, do you follow my point? They want to be recognized for what they are. This is obviously art for art's sake that started long time ago. It is very hard now to say, let's all have a public purpose, as they seem to have done in the American Renaissance. You're a sculptor, make me a Lee on horseback. Show me how you can make the best equestrian and Take pride that this is part. Well, we can't do this now. I say I have my own agenda. I'm sorry. I make tall things. <laughs> and if they, f if they fit in a plaza, fine. If they don't fit in a plaza, too bad. If you think they mean God, fine. If you don't, too bad. I call it abstraction number 12. <laughs> you, make, you make what you can, you see? <laughs> 